Welcome to this session. My name is Diego Aranha. I'm an assistant professor uh, of cryptography at Aarhus University in the Department of Engineering. Before that, I spent seven years as assistant professor at different Brazilian universities. And at that time, um, I had the chance to take a look at the horribly insecure Brazilian voting machines. Uh, and today, I'm, I'm here to share this story. Uh, this is joint work with several people. Um, this was the team who participated in the uh, hacking challenge of the system in 2017. Uh, included Pedro Barbosa, Tiago Cardoso, Caio Ludes, and Paulo Matias. They still live in Brazil and work for different universities and companies. So the structure of my presentation is the following. I will start with background material, explain how the Brazilian elections are, are conducted using the system. Then I will tell the story of um, what vulnerabilities were found in the system by our, by our teams in these two different uh, opportunities, and then finish with future perspectives. So let's start with some context. Brazilian elections are very special in multiple regards. One of them is that it's just a massive election. We have more, more than 140 million voters, and voting is mandatory, which is not very democratic, but which means that we have uh, turnout rates over 80%. Elections are held every two years. We alternate between federal and municipal level elections. And they became electronic in 1996. So a fraction of the polling places in the 90s started using the, the voting machines. And this was expanded in the coming years uh, to all of the polling places. Um, so elections became fully electronic in 2000. One remarkable aspect of Brazilian elections is that the entire election workflow is under control of a single institution. Uh, they called Superior Electoral Court. They are part of the judiciary systems. They are, they are a branch of the Supreme Court. And they do everything about the elections. They decide what technology is, is going to be used. Uh, they write the software nowadays. They deploy the software. They do the logistics on the election day. They collect results. They transmit the results. They publish the results. And if any dispute after the elections arise about the results, since they are part of the judicial branch, they are the ones to, to settle these disputes in a hopefully fair judicial process. So for the uh, purpose of this talk, they will play the role of the evil empire. So this is the Brazilian voting machine. As you can see, it's composed of two terminals. On the left, you have the poll officer terminal. That terminal is used by the poll officer to essentially uh, type in the voter registration number or collect the voter fingerprint if the polling place has biometric identification enabled. On the right-hand side, the voters use um, the bigger terminal to cast their votes uh, using the keypad on the right. So this is not a touch screen uh, voting machine as you find in the US. Uh, this is uh, basically the interface of the voter is basically a keypad. So voters need to bring uh, numbers corresponding to candidates to cast their votes. Uh, and the biggest design flaw, as you can see already, uh, from the point of view of privacy, is that the two terminals are connected by a physical cable. This means that the big terminal knows who is voting for which candidates at the same time. And it's basically, um, we need to rely or trust the voting software to not break ballot secrecy by, by just storing this information. Some further quick facts. Um, so this is a DRE voting machine, as we call it. It's fully electronic, no paper record, uh, violating the best practices uh, uh, adopted around the world. It was claimed to be 100% secure, right? Uh, but only first tested uh, in 2012, so it, sta it stayed in operation for more than a decade without being evaluated in terms of security by independent teams. The hardware is manufactured by Diebold. I don't know if you heard the horrible stories about, about Diebold voting machines, but if, if you haven't, there is a great documentary called Hacking Democracy by HBO. It's on YouTube. Go watch it. It's great. Uh, and it tells the story of the leaked source code of the Diebold voting machines in 2004 and how much uh, how horrible that was. So take a look. So software initially was also manufactured by Diebold, but it became, uh, or it went under control of the electoral authority since 2006. And, and it's a huge code base. Uh, it's more than 20 million lines uh, of code and, and comments and so on, it's spread in, in a huge uh, uh, number of folders, um, composing the kernel of the operating system, user land libraries and applications. And this code runs in more than half a million voting machines. So these elections, again, are massive. They moved from Windows Compact Edition to Linux in 2008. So we had two presidential elections running on Windows, which is very scary. Uh, and they also briefly experimented with paper records in 2002. 
Um, so they, they, after lots of pressure from the technical community and the political parties, um, they had a trial of paper records in some of the polling places, but they concluded that uh, it wasn't worth the uh, extra cost and extra logistic uh, problems of uh, paper jams and, and printers malfunctioning, um, to, even considering the higher transparency. I'll talk more about this along the talk. Since 2011, the Electoral Authority has deployed fingerprint identification, and half of the population of the, of the voting population is already enrolled into the biometric identification system, which is another problem from the point of view of privacy because this database could, could leak, of course. So this is the election workflow. Uh, TSC, the Supreme Electoral Court, is responsible for the voting software. So they have a, a team of developers writing software uh, for the machines uh, in between elections. At some point, they decide that a version of the software should be inspected by political parties. So they open the, the source code of this voting software in their premises. So if you are affiliated to a political party or some other uh, institutions from the judicial branch of the government, you can go to the headquarters of the electoral authority in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, uh, and then inspect the source code there for uh, some time um, under restrictions. I'll talk more, more about restrictions later on. At some point, they decide that this looks good enough to uh, hold an election, so they transmit the voting software to the local branches of the uh, electoral authority, um, so the different states. This happens, of course, through the internet, some kind of VPN connection to transmit the software. On the local branches, uh, the software is loaded into memory cards, and these memory cards install the software in the voting machines. So the machines have no uh, internet connections, no, no networking interfaces of any kind, so they communicate with the outer world by just uh, using memory cards. So uh, software, the voting software is installed a few days before the election, um, and then of course on the election day votes cast their votes, and now after this happens, the voting machines produce files on USB drives uh, called media of results, and these files are collected by the poll officers and transmitted back to the electoral authority to, to combine them in the global outcome of the election. And if you don't like the, the result of the election, of course, as a party, you can ask for a post-election audit, but this has also uh, many restrictions. So this is the basic election workflow. We are more interested into the, what happens on uh, the polling place so as I said, uh, one of the install cards is in the top uh, right corner. Uh, is used to install software in the machine a few days before the election. Each card installs 50 machines, which is an interesting scaling factor for the attacker if he can get his hand on one of these cards. And then on the election uh, day, between 7 and 8 a.m., the poll officer is responsible for uh, initializing the machine, so booting up the machine, and printing what we call the zero tape. So this is basically a paper document attesting that no votes were cast to any candidate before the election started. Of course, this only makes sense if the voting software is behaving honestly, right? Because malicious software could still print a bunch of zeros and give the impression that no votes were cast. Then the, the voters can um, authenticate themselves uh, with the uh, uh, poll officers present their fingerprint or their uh, documents, and then they can cast their votes. This goes on until 5 p.m. If there are no queries, the poll officer then types in a command in his terminal to end the voting session. And at this time, the voting machine does a bunch of things. It prints a poll tape with the partial results for that polling place. It also writes, as I said, several files into the USB uh, drive. Uh, you can see one of these drives in the uh, bottom right corner. Uh, they are very colorful. And these files include a digital version of the poll tape, uh, a file called the digital record of the vote that I'll explain in more detail, and, and a log, and among other files. These files became, uh, become public after the election, and they can be requested by political parties for auditing or, or uh, just to inspect if something wrong happened during the election. So after the election or the Activities in a certain poll, uh, poll place stop. The poll officer is responsible for detaching this USB drive and connecting it to another computer, uh, usually in a school. Elections are uh, very frequently, uh, the poll places very frequently happen in schools. Um, and then the contents are transmitted to the central tabulator. The central tabulator collects all the partial results throughout the country, uh, add them together, and publish the final result. So this is very typical of a paperless uh, voting machine election. Most of them just follow a, a similar variant of this process. So in terms of security, the machines um, have been 
evaluated a few times, usually on what the election authority call uh, the public security tests. There have been four uh, events of this uh, under this name. The first one was in 2009, and participants uh, didn't have access to the source code on this first event, so it was essentially a black box um, inspection thing. I participated for the first time in 2012 when we had access to the source code. Um, there was another event in 2016 which provided access to the source code, but participants had to sign an NDA, which forced you to keep their secrets for life. So I didn't think this was reasonable back then. I still don't think it's reasonable. So I didn't participate in 2016. Participated again in 2017 when the NDA was much more relaxed in terms of scope. Um, so out of the four events, I participated in two of them, and I will uh, uh, present the results here. But that of course, uh, the, the Objectives for the participants here are clear. You need to break the two main security properties of any voting system. Either ballot secrecy, which means revealing votes uh, corresponding to certain voters, or to break ballot integrity, which means uh, changing, manipulating the election outcome. A major problem of these public security tests is that they are not very public. They are actually uh, very restricted. So some of the restrict restrictions that happens there, uh, you can't you can inspect the source code on separate machines, separate computers, but you cannot take notes on paper. So if you need something from the huge code base, you need to memorize it yourself or do multiple round trips to copy byte by byte, right? So you can still do this. The, the, the computers are close enough that this is still doable. There are just three days to inspect the whole code base uh, and, and four days to mount attacks. In 2017 was this. In 2012 was a little, uh, uh, it was a little shorter. All the participants in attacks needs, need to be pre-approved by the electoral authority so they know exactly who is participating and what attacks will be mounted. I don't know if participants or uh, interest in attacks were rejected in the past because this information never became public, but you know, they have a screening process to select what they want to be uh, um, tested. And participants have no guarantees about the software. You don't know if this is the right software, a recent version of the software. Uh, and sometimes there are rumors about, oh, yeah, you exploited the version of the software, but this was not really the production version. So it's very confusing for participants to know um, how, how legitimate this is. And of course, since this is the electoral authority organizing a hacking challenge to evaluate security of its own machines, this presents conflicts of interests everywhere, right? So um, you see many conflicts of interest. I would even argue that the fact that a single institution conducts the whole election process is a conflict of interest itself. So in 2012, we found many vulnerabilities. Uh, we wrote a 40-page report uh, detailing, detailing those. So the um, most serious one was a vulnerability in the vote shuffling mechanism to break ballot secrecy. Ballot secrecy in Brazil is extremely important. It's a constitutional requirement. Uh, and we have a history of voter coercion. Uh, it's so frequent in Brazil that it, ha it has its, voter coercion has its own name in Portuguese. Um, voto de cabresto, as we call it. We also found very inadequate management of cryptographic keys. So all the internal memories and the install cards which uh, interface with voting machines have encrypted partitions to store sensitive data as the voting software and other uh, um, and cryptographic keys, for example. And all these encrypted partitions um, are encrypted under the same symmetric key. So we have one single key encrypting more than half a million uh, encrypted partitions in different machines. Uh, and we found that this key was stored in plain text. It was hard coded in the source code. It's a classic from the 90s, right? Actually, most of this talk will be at about 90s level of security practices. Um, we also found that the voting software, uh, the integrity checking mechanism is very flawed. The voting software basically checks its own signatures um, to verify if it was tempered with. Um, of course, this makes no sense in the point of view of security because a malicious uh, agent could still manipulate the voting software to not check itself but give the impression that uh, the, the machine is still operating correctly with the correct software. So since this is a paperless voting machine, uh, ballot secrecy and integrity ultimately rely or depend on the integrity of software. And we found ways, although we couldn't experiment them in practice because of lack of time, um, we found ways to, to break this uh, uh, integrity property, which means this translates directly to no ballot secrecy or integrity for the ballots, for the results. So at the time, we, we concluded this was a result of an insecure development process. Uh, conducted under, under an inadequate adversarial uh, model, which completely disregards insider threats. 
um, and also a culture that internally doesn't value transparency, as it's very common from uh, voting system vendors, surprisingly. So now I'll talk more about the uh, uh, digital record of the vote. So this is a file that uh, one of the public files produced by the system, and it has an interesting story. So in 2002, the election authority played, experimented with paper records, but concluded that they were too cumbersome. So they replaced the paper trail with a redundant electronic trail. So the voting software not only counts votes, but also stores votes in a shuffled order in a digital file, which again makes no sense from the point of view of security. This is just a redundant record of the same result. But they still claim that this allows for a recount possibility. So if a political party thinks that the results are not fair, you can still count the votes in this file and check with the official counts. But this, again, makes no sense because the, if the attacker has control over the voting software, uh, multiple redundant uh, copies of the fake results will be produced and will pass any attempt of a recount later. So um, since this doesn't allow a recount, it doesn't improve uh, ballot integrity in any way. We also claimed at the time that uh, this basically makes ballot secrecy more fragile. So let's suppose that the first voter here voted uh, 71 for governor, uh, an invalid number for senator, so it's a new vote, and blank for president because he didn't like any of the options, which is very frequent in Brazil too. Um, and then, as you can see, the different votes are shuffled together for different races. So it, it's, if the shuffling is done right, uh, it, this shouldn't leak the choices for the first voter or the second voter and so on. But of course, if the shuffling is not done uh, following the best practices, maybe it can be reverted later and then ballot secrecy is at risk. Um, a problem with this file is that it was introduced in the system by law, which means that you need to change the law to remove the file from the system or to, to, to the, for the file to not be produced by the system, which again teaches a lesson about how not to legislate technology. Um, sometimes, well, if you go too far, you need to change the law just to fix a vulnerability. And the gray cells in this file, they are present in the final version of the file, the, the one made public. Uh, and they correspond to absentee votes. So uh, in this hypothetical election, I think we have seven voters. Uh, in total, four of them didn't show up. And this will be important in the future. So um, in 2012, uh, the Electoral Authority uh, had a, like an opening talk, explained the security measures of the system, and they explained this mechanism in detail, uh, how votes are shuffled uh, in this file. Uh, so we immediately thought, oh, generating random bits for shuffling votes is hard on a embedded system, so this might be a promising initial point of attack among the tens of millions of lines of code that we have to inspect here. So since we were academics, we thought, let's try to find some bias in the uh, shuffling of this, that, and then we can do advanced crypt analysis using statistical methods to revert the shuffling, as any academic would think, right? But we started from the low-hanging fruit first, so we just scanned it for RAND in the whole code base. This was literally the first command we run on the code base. It took a few minutes to finish, and we found a match uh, in a file called drv.cpp, which has a very suggestive name. So at the time, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Let's see what, what's the seed for this random number generator. And then we found this, which is, again, a classic. So if you don't code in C, this is a very bad random number generator receiving a, a horrible seed as input. As you know, a PRNG should receive a, a truly random seed and expand the entropy of the seed in a much longer sequence of numbers for the shuffling process here. Uh, instead, they just pick uh, timestamp in seconds. And since this uh, line of code was in the uh, startup phase of the system, this means it needs to run uh, between 7 and 8 a.m. on the election day. So there are only uh, 3,600 possible seeds. And remember that in the digital record of the vote, we had gray cells for the absentees. Those actually allow you to check if a seed is possible or not. You just um, select a seed, feed, uh, seed the, the random number generator with the seed, um, and then try to store k out of n votes and see if the holes match the polling place uh, file that you are attacking. If they match, you probably have the right seed. So we thought, oh, we have already an exhaustive search uh, attack for a much smaller uh, fraction of the seed space that may reveal us a couple of seeds that are correct candidates for a certain polling place. 
But at the end, we didn't have to do anything uh, that sophisticated because the seed was printed in a public document. So uh, it was the timestamp printed on the zero tape. So our very sophisticated attack, as called by the electoral authority in the press at the time, which I don't know if it's a compliment or not, um, was basically taking a look at this file, finding the right timestamp, seeding the PRNG, and then reverting the uh, shuffled votes after the election. This can happen any time after the election. And the idea, of course, is um, for perhaps a candidate to coerce voters into voting for himself and then checking afterwards if they actually kept their promises. And then selectively punish the ones who didn't um, with a mathematical statistical guarantee, right? So it's a fair punishment in a way. So this would be a way for a, political, uh, for a politician or a candidate to break ballot secrecy for a whole uh, polling place, but there are other attacks made possible by this, uh, the way the system is designed. So this is a Supreme Court judge called Lewandowski. Uh, he was the president of the Electoral Authority in 2010, and this is a picture of him voting. And we know that in 2010, he voted at 11, 20, um, and 37 seconds, um, because the picture published by the Electoral Authority has this on the exit data. So it's very precise timing. Uh, and the log file of the voting machine actually stores timestamps for votes in sequence. So if you know a timestamp for a certain voter, like a public authority, you can find out exactly uh, what's the position of this voter in the query, right? And if you can recover votes in order, you can recover the vote of a specific Supreme Court judge. Uh, of course, we never did this for the 2010 election. First, because it would be anti-democratic, and second, because we would most likely end up in jail which is not nice, uh, but the conditions are still there, uh, and anyone with minimal knowledge about how the software works can still do it, because the files are, again, public to the political parties. So no defense in depth for this mechanism, uh, anyhow. So some conclusions from uh, that experiment. It was trivial to recover the votes in order, as I explained. Uh, trivial to re recover a vote cast in that specific time, perhaps by uh, a more important voter, in a way, a public authority. And the recommendations uh, we gave were just eliminate the DRV file. It doesn't improve ballot integrity in any way. It doesn't allow recounts. It's basically a way to make ballot secrecy more fragile. So it's a design flaw, although mandated by law. And do not store metadata about the voters. Uh, do not store timestamps. This makes no sense. Um, they claim that they need this for statistics, but you can, well, maybe the voting software can compute these statistics and not store metadata in instead. So they kind of fixed this by replacing the horrible PRNG with a custom algorithm they designed, uh, which is actually based on a PRNG, which didn't pass peer review uh, uh, process, and I think uh, um, it was designed by, by, by an amateur, and he, on his own website, he says that this shouldn't, shouldn't be used for cryptographic purposes. So it's just like a hobby project. But they seeded with system entropy, which makes it harder to exploit. Uh, and the interesting thing is the voting machine has two hardware RNGs, which should be much better than all these different alternatives that they have considered. And the justification they provide for not using the hardware RNGs already in the machine, one is in the processor. It's a geode processor with a, a TRNG implemented inside. The other one is a TRNG, which was specifically purchased for the voting machine, which has a kind of HSM device inside. And they justify that because not all voting machines have these TRNGs, they can't use them in the software, which again makes no sense, and implies that the security of all machines will depend on the worst model in operation, which in 2012, I think, was the 2007 model without the TRNG in hardware. So in 2017, we wanted to resume the work we did on trying to break ballot integrity or software integrity. So we thought of software installation as the attack vector. Um, in other words, intercepting install cards and trying to replace the software inside the install cards um, to, to, with a malicious uh, version, of course. And we claimed that this could be possible in practice because, as you can see from the pictures, this installation ceremony, uh, although it's, it's a public secure ceremony, as they claim, uh, it doesn't look very secure. In practice, you can see in the pictures uh, confused people. You can also see guests uh, visiting the premises to see how the process goes. So there is some opportunity for an attacker to replace some of the install cards there. Of course, if this is an insider attacker, he has already uh, access to these install cards or devoting software at the root. But we are thinking here of an external attacker intercepting install cards. 
an obstacle to make this happen, of course, is the machine has plenty of cryptography uh, in multiple places. So the install cards have encrypted partitions, as I told you, um, encrypted under uh, AES-256 on the a variant of the XTS mode of operation for disk encryption. So that's why we call it the XTS prime mode. So they have a minor tweak that may, might make the algorithm less secure. So they rotate one of the constants more frequently than they should. It's not clear why. Uh, and the key that embeds, the key that encrypts these install cards is embedded in the kernel. So it's still hard coded uh, in the software. For integrity checking, uh, there are digital signatures. Uh, computed both in user land, compute, verified actually both in user land and kernel mode. And, and the keys for signing results of the election are also stored in the internal memory of the voting machine, uh, encrypted under another key embedded in the kernel. So there is plenty of cryptography in multiple places that an attacker would need to circumvent um, to, to be able to replace the software or fake results. But we will see that um, there are design flaws that make this much easier than it should be. So. This is how encryption works um, in the voting software. Basically, uh, the, the machine boots from a uh, bootloader, and the bootloader decrypts an image of the kernel under AES-256 ECB mode of operation, which is not great. Um, the kernel encrypts both the file system, or decrypts both the file system and a set of authentication keys. These are encrypted under different uh, modes of operation for AES-256, and both keys are embedded in the kernel. So they are hard-coded in the source code. Well, in 2017 again, so on the call for participation of this hacking challenge, um, the electoral authority said that researchers wouldn't have access to cryptographic keys. Um, and, and since I was still young and, and naive at the time, I thought, oh, maybe they just did a huge refactoring of the system to not store crypto cryptographic keys in the source code anymore, following our recommendations from five years earlier. But when we had access to the source code, we figured out that they just erased the, the uh, cryptographic keys from the source code, and, and which was um, a little depressing to find out. But you know, there is some, some fairness in the universe, I think. Um, and we, there we go again. We looked for keys in the source code. <laughs> it worked on the last time, right? So you need to try it again. And then we found uh, the ES key in a file called ueminix.c. U is, is the name for voting machine, or the acronym for voting machine in Portuguese. Minix, of course, is the operating system, so it's the format of the partition, partitions they use. Um, and when we look at this file, we found this. So it was the, the uh, file system, the Minix file system encryption key, hard-coded again in software. And the reason for that was they were moving from kernel 2.16 to 3.10 at the time, uh, and they had then two copies of the uh, cryptographic keys in the two branches of the kernel, they erased just one of these copies and forgot about the other, which um, was great for accelerating our progress uh, in this. So when we got hold of this cryptographic key, we wrote a legal program to uh, decrypt the install cards, and then um, we could violate uh, that encryption uh, property there. So we could read files from the file system, although we could still not read the authentication keys directly to fake results because we couldn't, at the time, uh, find the, the key in the source code. So we moved it directly to see what we could do with the uh, decrypted file system. So then when we did this, we started to study how to the, the authentication or the, the integrity checking mechanism works. Um, so basically, the machine boots from um, HSM-like device called the Master Security Device, the MSD. And this device verifies signatures. So the device verifies if the BIOS has a matching signature, uh, and this is computed using ECDSA. The BIOS will do the same for the bootloader. The bootloader will do the same for the kernel image. Uh, and the kernel only is modified to only load, load uh, binaries and libraries which have a corresponding RSA signature, um, which is still valid. And the public key is, again, embedded in the kernel. Um, so they have this customized way of, of signing binaries that will reject or they should reject binaries which don't have valid signatures anymore. For the other kinds of files, they have redundant uh, detached signatures. So in the file system, you find uh, many VST files containing signatures for the other files. These include, again, the shared libraries, but also vote, uh, election metadata and so on. And these are computed using an Elgamal uh, signature scheme instantiated with, with elliptic curves again. So they have many signatures everywhere. 
But when we inspected this at depth, we found several issues with authentication. Uh, first of all, two of the shared libraries uh, didn't have signatures. Uh, at least the VST detached signature is stored in the file system. The names of these files were libapilog.so and libhkdf.so. The first one, of course, deals with uh, login events. And the second one generates uh, a further uh, a encryption key for protecting the DRV. I'll talk about this um, in slightly more detail later. Um, but when we found these files without signatures, we thought, well, maybe we can change the contents or, I don't know, play with the files a little bit and see if the, the system would still accept them as legitimate. Um, and of course, this happened. And the justification for, uh, that they gave for not signing these shared libraries was, this, uh, the system was being refactored, so they, they broke part of the code base in these two additional libraries, and they just forgot to include the libraries in the scripts that sign uh, the, the binaries and all the files for the system, so they just forgot to, to change the scripts. So you get files without signatures that you can temper with uh, and still be accepted by uh, the software. And later on, later on, we found out also that the kernel side verification for the uh, shared libraries was flawed. Uh, basically, the uh, function verifying signatures would return a negative number in case they were not valid, but this was stored in an unsigned integer, which again, another classic from the 90s. Uh, and then a check would just see if this number was, was non-negative, right? Of course, it's an unsigned integer, it's always uh, non-negative, so it looks good, let's, let's run this, this library because uh, it's certainly legitimate. A nice surprise was the voting software is actually linked with these two shared libraries, which means that we could inject code in these libraries to change uh, code in the, the voting soft in the voting application itself in runtime, although the voting application is still apparently had all the signatures correctly verified. So for the authentication chain, we uh, violated all these this properties, so the detached signatures uh, were, not, were missing for two shared libraries, and also uh, the verification code for shared libraries in the kernel was flawed to the unsigned integer uh, section of code I showed you in the previous slide. So we could tamper with shared libraries and, and still the system will still behave correctly. So with this, of course, we had arbitrary injection code, uh, code injection capabilities. We first played with the log contents uh, to change events on the log, and the machine ran a, a simulated election without uh, complaining about this, so the log was corrupted. We also um, used the HKDF library to uh, generate a key we knew for the DRV. So this uh, a technicality, but I think it's interesting. So the DRV file is encrypted under yet another key to prevent a power officer from uh, taking two copies of the file after, uh, in between one vote, because the differences between uh, versions of this file reveal what vote was cast last, right? So uh, to prevent a power officer from extracting two copies of this file, and computing the differences, I don't know, after a Supreme Court judge uh, voted, uh, the file is, is kept in encrypted form. But since we control the function that generates this key, we just generated an all zero key, so we could decrypt the file and break ballot secrecy for another uh, public authority vote in a simulated election. So the, the kernel is still loaded um, USB drive, so we could plug in a keyboard and, and issue commands to the voting software, not because it was useful, more because it was fun. Um, we also uh, changed the software version to something funny. We played with the screen contents. We changed messages we could, just to prove that we could, uh, in runtime, manipulate the behavior of the voting application, the official one, in a way that's feasible and affects elections. Um, at the very last hour of the last day, we could manipulate how votes are stored. So we could prevent the voting software from storing any votes, which triggered an error in the voting software. So we were um, loading the last payload, which would move votes from one candidate to the other um, as the, the most impactful attack, of course. Uh, but this was interrupted by the electoral authority because um, the activities were supposed to finish at 6 p.m. on a Friday. So we couldn't uh, finish this attack. But anyways, this is a, would be a direct consequence of having arbitrary code injection. It was just a matter of you know, not fitting to the uh, dairy schedule. And one very problematic thing on this specific uh, challenge is due to the restrictions, you can't use your own equipment. You need to use their computers, which means we spent a long time dealing with uh, offline installation of packages uh, and dealing with dependencies. So we had multiple round trips to just pick, I don't know, uh, dependencies for Ubuntu packages to run our tools. So it was, it's not the most comfortable place to work. <laughs> 
So this is uh, a screenshot of the official simulator of the voting software, so you understand what, what we did. Um, so here, this is a mock election for president. Uh, someone is voting for swimming, is, is the way it's, it's, uh, the simulator works, uh, by typing number 61. So you can see it's a, a string on the top left corner. Um, in Portuguese, it's seu voto para, which means your vote goes to, as, as in the Oscars, right? Uh, and then we replace this with vote 99, which would influence a voter to pick a less democratic uh, option. Of course, this would be easy to detect, but I still claim that such a simple change in the voting software would create a mess in an official election and would probably cast um, a very uh, dark shadow of, uh, on the credibility of the electoral authorities. So this would uh, disrupt an election completely, even such a small change. Um, so the conclusions from uh, that particular hacking challenge was, were that uh, all the partitions are insecurely encrypted, the, the keys are still stored in, in plain text in source code, which means they are trivial to capture by an insider, and in this specific case, um, another team actually found a way, another way into this uh, key without access to the source code, so they basic, basically could run the install card in a virtual machine and Execution would progress until the key was visible in memory, in the memory layout of the virtual machine. So this would make the attack fully external. By just combining the two attacks, an attacker could run the install card on a simulator, pick the key, decrypt the install card, found, find the issues with integrity checking mechanisms, and then replace the voting software with something uh, very dangerous. So at the time, we recommended them to first automate the signing process so they don't forget about new shared libraries that are introduced into the system, and, and again, Please deploy some proper key management. Uh, sharing the same key throughout the whole country doesn't make sense in points of view of security. If the key leaks anywhere, you have nationwide impact on, on, on the software, which um, is not, it's far from best practices. Instead of doing this again, uh, they fix by not storing the uh, keys on source code anymore, but instead deriving keys from, uh, with the help of the BIOS. So the BIOS stores some kind of mysterious table with uh, hopefully random data that's used for a key derivation function to, to compute, the key that decrypts the file system. But uh, of course, an insider still has access to those, and it would be trivial for an insider to just load software that prints this key on the screen, and then they, they would know exactly what key this is, although this is harder for people participating on the hacking challenge to, to obtain this key. So it doesn't solve the root problem at all. So the problems I still see are in the way um, the voting system is used in Brazil is, first of all, the software is still secret. It has been under uh, production for more than 20 years, but it can only be inspected in very restricted occasions under NDAs or under very tight uh, uh, inspection windows, as I described. Although the software was de demonstrated to be insecure in multiple occasions, um, here I just talked about two of them, but the, there were other attacks mounted by other teams in other editions. There is no paper record for a recount, so voters cannot verify during the election that the system is behaving correctly, it's, it's storing the votes um, correctly. There are also no effective ways to audit the system. This is a paperless, uh, um, fully electronic voting system, so you have to rely on digital files produced after uh, or provided after the election to try to detect some misbehavior, which is far from ideal again, uh, especially if you consider that elections should be independently verifiable by um, anyone without the technical expertise. So it's, it's not, it doesn't belong to technologists, but to society instead. Uh, there are conflicts of interest everywhere, as I uh, explained in the field, and insider attacks are still completely disregarded. And this I find very problematic, uh, because as you probably know, Brazil is famous for its corruption scandals, uh, which it's enough evidence um, to consider insider attacks uh, within any threat model of a system um, facing society in a critical way like an election software. So how can we solve these problems? Um, so the best practices adopted in other countries and also considered in academia to be um, the, the state of the art in electronic elections is to deploy what we call software independent systems. These are basically systems which provide a physical record of the votes, not to be taken by the voters uh, out of the polling places, of course, because this would damage ballot secrecy and, and would um, facilitate voter coercion but these physical records remain in the polling places for an audit afterwards. And it doesn't have to be a recount or, or, or fall ballots. You can do statistical sampling in what uh, 
experts call risk limiting audits to get a, a confidence margin that the uh, count, the electronic count was correct by matching with the uh, sample of the paper records. Um, and this has been deployed successfully in several countries. Here I, I showed two examples. Um, so India uh, in 2014 after uh, one particular security analysis um, deployed paper records as mandated by the Supreme Court of that country. So they, they started a, a pilot project to, to expand this to the whole country, so it's in process. You can see the picture of the, the printer and the Indian voting machine on the left-hand side there. On the right-hand side, you have the scanners used in most of the US states, uh, in which you do risk-limiting audits to verify if the counts done by the scanners are, are correct. And in particular, this is considered to be the state of the art in terms of cost benefit because you have a relatively simple equipment to count the votes. It's just a scanner. You can also recount by hand if you don't trust the scanner. You can build a different scanner to count the, the, the ballots. And you have a single record of the votes marked by the voters. So you have no redundancy problems or dispute between paper and electronic records. You just go to the paper record to verify or to audit in case of any dispute. And uh, I, I also believe that one way to solve problems is to increase voter and, and technical community participation in how the system is conducted. So um, electoral authorities everywhere should just engage uh, society and, and the local communities to, to help improve the security of systems uh, instead of uh, fighting with them all the time as it usually happens. How not to solve these problems? Um, well, deploy internet voting, this is a horrible idea. Although it frequently comes up, oh, your voting machines are insecure, let's vote through uh, your, our cell phones, right? Great idea. Um, so a few countries have deployed this. Estonia is, is most likely the, the, uh, the, the biggest installation. Uh, but Estonia is a very different country. Um, they, they do everything online and they, have very, they are very small, so things scale better. Uh, and, but even though there is a uh, sequence of works showing vulnerabilities and, and um, how the Estonian system is also not secure. In particular, the problems with internet voting are uh, malicious uh, um, software running on the clients, right? So now you have to protect your device to vote securely, unless uh, otherwise you could have um, malware voting for you. There is a problem with insiders. This is a centralized voting system under control of a company or the electoral authority, so, so a malicious insider could um, deal great damage. Um, and, and of course, I don't think it's a good idea to have just the internet between you and your vote, because you know this is openly accessible to um, attackers and even nation state attackers with a bigger uh, budget than, than most uh, attackers we consider in our threat models. So voting through the internet is not a good idea. For more reasons about why this wouldn't work, you can check uh, the recent, very recent experiment about the Swiss voting system. So they, they conducted a hacking challenge for the, uh, one month. It finished last Monday. We participated a little uh, together with other people uh, from Aarhus University who are present here. But um, you can see um, results by Sarah Jamie Lewis and Vanessa Teague and others about how they found issues with this software and, and how this, these issues would still allow an insider from, f uh, would allow an insider to fake results without being detected. Another way to not solve any of the problems is to adopt the blockchain, right? Because uh, blockchain blockchains usually do not solve any problems, and this is also true for elections. Um, most, because they imply internet voting. You don't want to use a blockchain to store votes if people are not voting remotely through the internet. So this uh, blockchain voting implies all the problems with uh, internet voting and, and doesn't really uh, solve any meaningful problems uh, in terms of independent verification. It would still be a paperless, uh, centralized system uh, in terms of, of interface and, and transparency. So for Brazil in particular, um, I see ways to improve this in the future. Uh, so voter verifiable uh, uh, paper trails should be reintroduced in the system uh, for higher security for voters to be able to identify um, if the system is, is behaving correctly. This has been a legal debate in Brazil, so Congress has approved multiple times laws mandating paper records to be reintroduced. Um, the latest version of this law was suspended by the Supreme Court on grounds of unconstitutionality. So they claim that um, the paper records would violate ballot secrecy and then are incompatible with the Constitution, although this makes no sense. And the voting machine already, uh, at least certain versions of the software, um, had very uh, fragile guarantees for ballot secrecy. But that's, that's the legal understanding of the Supreme Court, uh, which again 
presents another conflict of interest. I would believe that opening the voting software um, for external inspection without all those restrictions would be better for transparency. It doesn't solve all problems because it's still a hard problem to see, or to verify if the voting software you inspected at home uh, is running in the voting machine in front of you when you, you go there to vote. Uh, but at least this would put more pressure uh, in the design decisions uh, towards security because then it becomes embarrassing to publish uh, source code that, that's full of holes. Uh, but then the Swiss post case uh, may contradict my view and companies would just defend and justify their vulnerabilities instead of fixing uh, their problems and admitting that their development practices are far from ideal. In Brazil in particular, uh, mechanisms for society to control how elections are conducted should be increased. Again, uh, this, it's always important to remember that elections, even electronic elections, do not belong to technologists, they belong to society. This is a system funded by taxpayer money, so it should serve the interests of society. And with this increasing polarization uh, around politics uh, in the whole planet, essentially, having independently verifiable elections are more important than ever. Uh, this reduces friction, uh, friction and, and, and polarization and may uh, improve democracies uh, in the way they are supposed to work. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. I have a bunch of references that you can check for reading more about the work. And I'm open for questions. Thank you. Yes. Great. Um, so the question was about the voter database, which I didn't mention. Yeah, I know, I know basically nothing about the voting database because the scope of this test was restricted to the voting machine. So one restriction of these uh, hacking challenges is the electoral authority decides what they want to put for inspection. So uh, to, sit, to cite some examples that are still out of scope, uh, the, election, the transmission infrastructure, the database, and the fingerprint uh, identification system are still out of scope. And it's great that they, uh, the justification for that is they don't consider this to be mature enough to be uh, put for adversarial testing in these hacking challenges, but it's in production, right? So it's funny that it can work in production, but no one can take a look. Uh, so I have no idea about how the, the database works, but I suspect that uh, security practices are not much better than uh, what happens in the software, otherwise we would have a walking contradiction here. Are there more questions? Yes. So the, the question was about transmitting votes, right? There is a machine at the end collecting all these partial votes and publishing the, the official outcome. Uh, we didn't see this piece of software, but I would consider that the most transparent uh, stage in the election workflow due to the following. At the end of the election, uh, the voting machines print physical records of the poll tape, um, and also digital versions that are transmitted to the tabulator. Uh, and then this ver the, the versions, the electronic files that they receive are published in the internet three days after uh, the result of the election. So if you have a copy of the uh, paper, uh, of the physical record of the poll tape, you can match the two and see if the voting uh, or the transmission of the specific polling place was done uh, without manipulation. So you can do a sample of this and try to get uh, some statistical guarantee that uh, transmission was not a problem. But yes, we didn't see the, the, the software itself that receives these uh, files because it was out of scope. They calibrate very carefully the scope they, they want for these hacking challenges and they only present software that they believe is mature enough for that. But it's what you get, yeah. Thanks for the question. Are there more questions? Yes. So, so the question was, was on, uh, on a depressive way, right? Do you think that the security of the system will improve with time? Are there incentives towards that? So um, I have to say that I, on, on the last time we participated, I sensed a better attitude on their side of receiving feedback and fixing the problems they have with the system. Um, 
so talking to the technical staff was not a problem. They, they fully understand what, what we did and, and how we did it and what should be fixed. Although they have their engineering and, and timeline constraints to deploy proper fixes, it's not an easy job, I, I have to admit also. But the biggest problem is uh, on the upper layers of management and, and, and public facing institution, this one in particular, they are much more uh, worried about reputation than actually earning that reputation. So uh, we had several conflicts in the press about they saying that, oh, these experts are just uh, um, creating sensationalism or, or hyping up their claims and the system was always secure, it will always be secure. This was just a minor detail somewhere, not very different from other countries. So um, this creates conflict and it makes harder to collaborate with them. Um, so I see some, some potential for improvement in the technical side, talking to the technical staff, I have no hopes about the upper layers of management in that authority. I would like, if I could choose, um, that this, the process was not under uh, the umbrella of a single institution. Uh, I think involving multiple institutions which had to, to which would force an adversary to, to collude, right? People from two institutions would make the system more robust. Uh, although you still need paper records or some kind of fiscal record for a recount. So we're splitting up the process into multiple institutions, perhaps um, in multiple branches of government as it should be, would also make the process more robust instead of holding everything inside one building where there is ample uh, uh, potential for, for fraud and, and manipulation. So yeah, maybe, maybe one day. Yes? Um, so the question was about uh, how open source development practices in interface with this, um, right? So um, this is funny because they still claim that the software here is open source because it's open within the building they work on, right? So they said, oh, you can come and, and you can check the source, so it's open to you if you come. Um, so which of course is not the way it should be. Uh, I believe that opening up the source would be good for security because then you get external eyes putting pressure behind the design decisions for them to be better. Uh, but again, it doesn't solve the root problem of how can you check that this, uh, the software you inspected, um, hopefully not that complex to, to reach millions of lines of code, it should be much simpler than this, is still running the machine uh, during the, the, the action day, which is the critical question here. So open source helps, but doesn't solve the problem of independent verification, right? You still need, especially uh, for no experts to verify that the system is working correctly. Okay, so a, a further question is why the not invented here, right? Why re-implementing things that are available uh, in open source for this, uh, well, for the Linux kernel, for signing binaries, for example, we were talking about this yesterday. Uh, I have no idea. I think it's, um, it's just, perhaps they started developing uh, this piece of software in, at a time where these were not available and they just created their customized uh, solutions for everything without much help from the outside or from experts and they just feel that this is the right way to do and, and only started to receiving feedback um, to improve their, their designs um, much later on and then it's too late, right? You, now you get uh, attached to the horrible code you wrote in the past, you, you feel that the urge to defend it instead of fix it. So, but I, I, I think we need a psychologist to understand this better. Are there further questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was why the 24 million lines uh, of code? Why, why that much uh, for just counting votes, right? It should be simple. Um, so this corresponds to actually the Linux kernel, the entire Linux kernel. So they have the whole kernel in their own internal repository with um, their own patches on top. So they have proprietary patches on, on, on top of the kernel. So this adds up like more than 10 million lines already. And then they have a bunch of uh, libraries uh, which are contributed from other projects to, to do some functions of, of the software. Again, a couple more million. Um, so this adds up quickly. Um, so it, I would prefer if, of course, they had um, a much smaller code base 
but this is probably a uh, curve that accumulated along the years, and, and, and it's the way it is. For a reference, um, there was one of the initial analysis of the Debold system, which found, I think, 100K lines of code in one specific critical piece of the software. And at the time, they, they considered that to be too large to secure or to inspect. And when I read this, I find it really funny because we had like orders of magnitude more to inspect here. So, um, but you know, developers, um, they, they love increasing the size of software and then demanding hardware upgrades because now everything is horribly slow. Um, but I think we also need a psychologist for this question too. I'm not, I'm not qualified to, to uh, there is no technical reason behind this. Uh, at least that I can think, I think of, uh, think of the, for the question. Do we have more questions? So thanks for your attention, thanks for the question. Have a nice day, see you sometime in the future.